I need to confess up to you about an addiction I've got. Oh, yeah? Okay. That drug thing's finally come out, has it? (laughs) And when you stood me up for that dinner the other night, we had this corporate dinner (laughs) that we were supposed to go to and sales because of this cough that she still sort of has. But, I mean, really, (laughs) you could have made it. Coughing is the new – it's problematic. I I don't have COVID, and you can hear in my voice I'm not super well. I've had a million negative COVID tests, but every time – if you've got a bad cough and you go somewhere and you're coughing your lungs up like I constantly am – you can tell that everyone is displeased with you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. But still, you pulled you out at like 4pm and I'm like, that is <laughs> dirty, dirty You pool. found out at 4pm. Oh, you pulled out at 6am. Oh, oh, no, I pulled wow. out at 6am because anyway, I had a bad sleep. I had a great time at the dinner in the end, <laughs> so it was good. But um, I was also sitting near David Anderson and I'm like, oh, well, I'm just going to tell him about your little drug problem. <laughs> My actual, He's our big boss. My actual drug of choice is Harry Styles. Um, I am addicted to okay. watching clips from Harry Styles' recent this Australian is, concert tour on TikTok. This is not what I was expecting. I, look, I loved that new How? album and I downloaded it as soon as it came out and it's so catchy and I love all the songs on it. Uh, and then now I just also love Harry Styles. And so Do you I love just, him in a romantic way? Uh, like, would you go there? <laughs> Question. It's a reasonable question. What a question. Um, I'd go there. He looks like my son. Um, okay. It's, it's hard to imagine weird. because... Paging Harry's, Dr. Freud to reception. The reality, Harry Styles wouldn't go there with me, so I feel like it's a pointless question. How do we know that? Well, I just know. He just wouldn't. You're one of the most beautiful women on television, according to... <laughs> Or my prime minister, though. Um, he is. I think he's absolutely beautiful. But I think, like we were talking about Claudia, Claudia Carvin the other day, she's got the magic sauce. He's got the don't, magic sauce. You don't have to worry about saying the other day. Everybody can see <laughs> that we're in the same clothes <laughs> as the last podcast. True. Okay. And our dirty secret is out that sometimes we, we record two, two podcasts at it's once true. because we find it difficult to find a time when we're both available. I think Harry Styles has got the special sauce and I'm addicted mm. to him and I, I wish he could do In the Room with me like I'd like Lin-Manuel Miranda. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, this is interesting because I met this fascinating woman a couple of weeks ago when I was um, speaking at a thing in Perth and her name's Borby Webster and she is your basic triple threat. She's like a, um, a classical musician she is a um, an elite athlete, rowing. Yeah, and she's also hot. So oh. anyway, but she established the Perth Symphony Orchestra. Oh, and what? Oh, so now you're she interested. She established the Perth Symphony Orchestra. Correct. The WA Symphony Orchestra. That's right. The Perth Symphony Orchestra. Right. So yeah. So hang on. So just so I've got this right. Mm-hmm. How old is she? Oh, she would be our age. Maybe so, are you telling me there's a West Australian Symphony Orchestra and a Perth Symphony Orchestra? There's two separate orchestras. Well, mate, now you're testing my knowledge. Well, but I'm just like, telling you, the WA Symphony Orchestra has existed for decades. Well, so the Perth cost... Symphony Orchestra was okay. established uh, when, when, when? Okay. Oh, Christ. Okay. I don't know when oh, it was established, okay. but All I right. think maybe 10 years ago. Like, okay. Not, it was established by her. So, what? Okay. Look, I'm all in favour of there being multiple orchestras, so that's good. Um, yeah. Okay. You sound suspicious, like you don't believe she well, exists. Well, I, I just... No. <laughs> But also, she's I like... I believe she exists. She's got a really interesting philosophy that we talked about a bit. You know, like, orchestras are still pretty male-dominated. Like, yes. there's lots of women, but often the lead performers are male. And, you know, there's a really interesting history that I wrote about in my 2014 book, The Wife Drought, about um, how orchestras started to change the way that they recruited and auditioned people. Yeah, they did because blind Because they auditions. were... Yeah, right. Yeah. So they started doing blind auditions where the musicians would play behind a curtain and it immediately changed the gender pattern of, you know, um, of, of recruitment. But anyway, um, she set up this orchestra that... Um, what's the word? Not part-time, sort of, you know... Flexible, <sighs> casual. Yeah, like so... Musicians that um, are sometimes aren't eligible for major orchestras because they've got different time commitments. They can't, they're not always available on a Friday night or whatever. Like, right. So they play at different times. Um, they have like they bring in all these other interesting instruments. Like it's quite a kind of modern and it's like very female dominated. Right. Anyway, that is all by way of background. She's a really interesting person. I really enjoyed meeting her. But she said to me. I am feeling sort of a bit embarrassed because I went to Harry Styles last night and I 
absolutely loved it. What's embarrassing about that? Well, because it's a bit teeny bopper, right? Like, so you know that book that we both loved by Tabitha, what's her face? Yeah. Um, the Benedict Cumberbatch Carnivan. one. Yeah. yeah um, sorry. Her this name is. This is not a book about. Yeah. Benedict this is not a book. Which is like one of the. Like, it's an unbelievably funny book, but also makes this really subtle and interesting argument about, well, look, why is it that, like, um, we view some things as embarrassing. Right, yeah, yeah. Like, so if you're obsessed with, you know, motocross or golf or something, that's okay. But, like, if you're obsessed with, you know... Harry Styles. Downloading images of Harry Styles or, you know... <laughs> yeah. um, I haven't gone bit, that far that's yet. That's a bit embarrassing. But I'm on um, par. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, and this woman was obviously... I'm a serious musician and I think she went with her kid or something um, to the concert... And she surprised herself by absolutely loving it and walking out of there just a massive fan. Right. And I'm like, all right, why is that? And why do you find that embarrassing? She's like, oh, just, you know, you know, I, I, she obviously thought of Harry Styles as this sort of teeny bopper, teen yeah. idol. And I said, what did you like about it? She said, well, the audience was almost entirely female and he was charming, yep. respectful, um, he really looked after that audience and he didn't talk down to them or anything like that. She said he had a host of really amazing female musicians, including a very kick-ass drummer apparently. And the third thing that she said was that um, it was just – she said it was a really well-composed set. He's got a great voice, mm. um, absolutely nailed it, like not phoning it in in any way at all. And she said she walked out of there just a rusted on fan. Yeah, it's um, – the, the album is – it's full of bangers that are very well produced and I mm. agree he's got a good voice. I think it's easy sometimes when someone's popular to dismiss them, especially if they're young, to yeah. dismiss them as like teeny bopperish. The yeah. other person, of course, this happens to is Taylor Swift. Sure, yeah. And so – Who I love. Again, if you go and Google Taylor Swift just singing acoustically with mm. her guitar, like – she really has got the goods. Like mm. she's not by no sense a manufactured person. Mm. This, of course, you know, goes back decades. Like you think when we were kids and Kylie Minogue first mm -hmm. brought out mm. music, um, it's really easy to be kind of dismissive mm. of, of a young person. So if you look at Kylie and Kylie's career, yeah. like how can you possibly dismiss somebody who's had a 30-year career right. and carried their fans for 30 years yeah. and continues to bring out songs that are great, shows that are amazing? Mm. Um, yeah, it's kind of a... I don't know what it is that, that prompts some kind of maybe snobbery or something. I don't know. Yeah. <coughs> anyway, you're now obsessed with Harry Styles. So that's I love good. Him. Yeah. Yeah. But so I want to see that film though, which because I don't know. Somebody, oh, yeah. You mean um, Don't Worry Darling? <coughs> yeah. Oh, I watched it. Oh. I watched it oh. on the way back from Perth on that very right. same flight because I had this conversation with this woman about Harry Styles and then I remember my Oh, my friend Lara, actually, who knows a lot about movies, saying to me, I actually think that's a really good film. And it kind of got, like, brushed a bit. Like It was, it was overshadowed by the fact that he was, was having an affair with Olivia Wilde in real life. Who's who the was director. director. Yeah. She was having a terrible breakup with Jason, I think his name's pronounced Sudeikis, oh who's Ted Lasso. <gasps> and really? Yeah. And so she no was, one tells me anything. I had no idea. I, knew, I remember there was some sort of bullshit around the Oh, film, there like was some. Was, so she was speaking at South by Southwest and when she was on stage, she was surfed with court papers because <gasps> it was known she would be there at this time. And like, so they had a really, really untidy divorce. Wow. And then the fact that she was seeing Harry Styles added to the then Brisson. God, imagine and that. And so the like, film. You know, publicity. that's bad news, isn't it? When your wife dumps you and like, yeah, yeah. I'm going out with Harry the Styles now. Harry you Styles. just like, okay, I'll get my coat. Yeah, I'll and see so out. the rounds of the film publicity was kind of a bit derailed by uh, because that been, yeah. their romance, and then I guess also the fact that it was kind of Harry Styles' first sort of foray into film, and so everyone was waiting to see, well, is he going to translate on screen as an actor? I thought he was fine. Just fine. Well, I don't think he was dynamite, but like right. I didn't. Wa I wasn't really watching it for him so much. I was watching it for Florence Pugh, who right. just is a glorious goddess. And what's um, the film called? It's called Don't Worry, Darling. Right. And it's um, it's I guess it's sort of a thriller, really. In the right. end, I mean, it starts off. It's a bit sort of um, so Florence Pugh and Harry Styles are married, and they live in this um, township that's been built in the desert. 
And it's all sort of 50s, mid-century chic, like she's wearing. So you kind of get the sense that it's set in the 50s, but then there's like modern stuff going on. So you're like, oh, what's going on here? Anyway, it, it looks like a movie set. Like it's, yeah. And beautiful design, um, the houses. And essentially, it's a community of beautiful young couples, husbands and wives, who are um, the husbands all go off to work every day, drive through the desert to this plant, factory, something. They're working on something and the wives aren't allowed to know <clears throat> exactly what they do. And the whole enterprise is run by this charismatic guy. Mm -hmm. Florence Pugh is like incredibly happy. They have sex all the time. She loves cooking and shopping with the other wives and stuff. And then she starts, like there's a neighbour who sort of goes crazy and walks into the desert with her son and then the son disappears and she's like never the same again. She's very troubled and she's starting to say things about what's happening out there, what they're doing, you know, we need to tell somebody we're being watched, you know, and all this sort of stuff. So then this sort of creepiness like comes in and then as Florence Pugh's character becomes more and more unsettled and she um, starts to wonder what's going on. She starts to fall apart and then the empire strikes back like they start trying to drug her and, you know, <laughs> anyway. And then so it sort of really um, develops as a sort of like almost a sci-fi kind of thing. And, you know, I'm, I hate sci-fi but um, I stayed for the frocks basically. And um, <laughs> it's a – I thought it was a really assured – piece of directing actually oh, okay, and I, right. I enjoyed the film I um I really enjoyed it actually and I thought yeah Harry Styles was good it's very handsome and you know I would say that he is um you know he absolutely pulled it off I wouldn't say like oh my god where have you been all this right. time like why haven't you been in films but like he it was very he respectable was solid. yeah right um I won't do a deep dive on this but just <laughs> stuff I've been watching um Kunk on Earth. I know I'm a bit late to that because everyone's already gone on about how funny Kunk on Earth is. Oh, my God. It is so, so funny. This is like me with Booker Prize winners where, oh. like, I don't read them and then years later I read them and I'm like, hey, my God, Shuggy Bane, it's amazing. And everyone's <laughs> like, well, where were you two years ago when I everyone know. was talking about that? It was Kunk on Earth. I know I was being massively annoying in our WhatsApp group the oh. other night because I was watching episode one and I was just – helpless with laughter I kept having to pause because I was just I reckon I'd laughed aloud 15 times in about the first five minutes and then um and then I kept I got to a point where I'd pause and I'd go oh my god because I knew you'd all watch it what about when she said blah blah anyway just finally like by the message end message after message after and we're like yes yes, yes it was thank funny. you we have it watched was funny when we watched it <laughs> weeks ago <laughs> but to give people an idea of the style of humor that episode, episode one, ends with her saying, next time on Kunk on Earth, we look at these two great books of history, the Bible and the Quran, and we answer, which one is the best? <laughs> <laughs> God, it made me laugh so It's hard. so good. Um, um, I laughed out loud um, yesterday and I actually brought the book in. I'm doing something which I'm supposed to not do, which is it's a book that's not out yet. Oh. Um, it's out in July. Oh, so you're really going to have know, to mention it like, again because it's terrible I will. to I mention it. I promise I will. And this is not um, – so this is a writer called Robert Skinner. Australian? <laughs> yeah, he's Australian. He works in a bookshop in Melbourne. Right. And it's called I'd Rather Not. And it starts with his account of like his decision to – quit work and go on the dole right. and his like desperate attempts to stay on the dole <laughs> and his dealings with these employment like agencies where he's like <laughs> he started reading war and peace and he explains that he really needs um some time to read war and peace and um <laughs> <laughs> One of his friends is like, oh, so you're writing a book? He says, no, I'm reading a book. <laughs> anyway, um, it's just hysterically funny and there's this bit where for some reason there's, an, there's a chapter where he goes, uh, look, for reasons that are still unclear to me, I agreed to go on a 10-day camel trek with my parents. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. The parents are ringing him to make plans. Um, I asked how far we'd be riding all up. There was a moment's silence. We're not riding, mate. They're wagon camels. We'd be walking, said my dad, next to the camels and for 25 k's a day. Oh. He paused. You have been training, haven't you? I said yes, in the sense that I'd managed to keep my legs in pretty much mint slash unused condition. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he's out on this camel cruise and like, 
he's just <laughs> struggling through the desert with a few other like complete like crazy people and eight camels that keep running everywhere <laughs> yeah. and like getting out of control. Uh, and he says, I don't know why this just made me actually cry with laughter. <laughs> <laughs> It's been quite a build up. um, (laughs) There's a peculiar anguish to seeing your own parents suffer. If it's your children suffering, you know or hope that it's because they're still building their characters, that the world will accommodate them somehow. But if it's it's your parents, you know that things are probably only going to get harder for them. The world for them is a cruise liner steaming towards the horizon, leaving them bobbing alone in the vast lonely ocean with only each other. My dad said, Jesus Christ, Bob, do you have to say all this shit out loud? It's pretty bleak. (laughs) (laughs) Such a, oh my God, because that first bit isn't in quotes or anything. So it's just like the most delightful little stylish joke where... (laughs) I'm finding... Jesus Christ, Bob, do you have to say this shit out loud? It's pretty bleak. I'm finding your amusement more funny than what you're reading oh, aloud. That's gutting. But like, anyway, I don't know. You I better just... mention it when it's actually for sale because how gutting would it be to this author yeah, that you're I talking know. about his book and it's not out I yet? I did no actually text it. the publisher um, and say, am I allowed to read a little bit? I'll like, just, I promise I'll mention it again. So like, right. put it in the thing, I'd rather not by Robert Skinner. All right. Just very funny. Now, you know how I said um, in the last podcast about how the universe like throws things at you and you're like, oh, how strange I'm reading these things yeah. around the same kind of thing. Yeah, so like us with Harry Styles. Like you have fallen in love with them and, and I've just watched, watched the, the movie. Film. Yeah. Um, that so was not planned. Two books that I read recently mm. that had similar themes. One was called The God of No Good by Cesar Walker and one's called Hip Hop and Hymns by Manio Bobo. Okay. Now, um, The God of No Good by Cesar Walker I came across because she's a chatter and she right. was she put posted in the group, I wrote this book, it's my first book, I'm so proud of it, blah, blah. She was... And the the only reason it caught my eye was because she's a teacher in Brisbane. And oh, I love okay. reading a book set in Brisbane because there's just not that many of them. So I thought, oh, okay, great, I'll go get that. So I got that. It's She's a woman in her 30s. It, it's a memoir. But it kind of reads almost like a coming-of-age book, even though she's in her 30s. So it's basically about... Um, so her family's from India. She's grown up in the Baha'i faith. Her relationship with her husband's fallen apart and they're splitting and she's met a dude via a dating app and so she's dipping a toe in the water. And right. the kind of context is she's doing that kind of present day life unravelling, trying to rebuild, but then looking back at a um, couple of generations back at the women in her family mm-hmm. and how mm. that plays and and also just the role of faith in their family, which is really interesting. Um, and so I enjoyed that. Then I picked up a book that's been sitting on my desk for a while because Manyo Bobo is one of my colleagues. She used to work with me on Late Line, oh, Age Scope. Right, right. And then strangely enough, it had some similar themes in that she's exploring, um, as the title might explain with hymns, a, quite a bit about her Christian faith and her mother's right. Christian faith and, and the role of that in her life. But also it's, it's also a memoir. Um, Manyo's family is from Ghana. It's about growing up in Musselbrook. She has this, as a, as a teenager, this kind of intense crush on this boy called Tice that kind of follows her throughout her life. And so it just sort of follows her um, Is Tice through. consulted in the book? Do Is we it, meet Tice? We do meet Tice, right. yeah. I, I thought Manu's writing I loved because it's very um, – she really – captured a sense of place really well like I felt like Musselbrook in the writing and I felt huh. there's a bit where she's in New York and I really felt like New York and Tice Tice and Manio's mother felt like very real kind of fleshed out and you know they are real because it's a memoir but they felt real to me and yeah. that's actually quite hard to do I think in writing is to make people feel fully complex and to not reduce them to you know sort of just being two-dimensional but just to give you a sense of the writing style and, and oh, yeah. I think you'll understand why I liked it when I read this. So it starts with, this is the opening. I didn't keep a journal during the most traumatic parts of my life because, let's face it, I didn't want to remember that shit. Mm. Some things, though, once lived through are hard to forget. And though the pain may have passed with time, each experience has come with a lesson. This is my recollection of some of the events that have shaped me as a person. I've debated whether to tell this story at all. After all, it doesn't cast me in the best light, but I'm sick of pretending to be someone I'm not. I'm sick of getting up every day, putting on my game face and living a guarded existence in which I'm not really me most of the time. I'm also tired of representing my race. And by that, I mean being on my best behaviour because, as is often the case, I'm the only black person some people will ever meet. I just want to be me. 
It's not just the people I don't know well. The first thing my mother said to me when I told her I was writing my life was, don't embarrass me. But my objective is to tell my story honestly without inhibitions, blah, 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 it goes on like that. And so I just, I love that really direct kind yeah. of, you know, no BS yeah, writing style. Yeah, it's very style. muscular. Very muscular writing style. And so it carries on like that, you know, the whole way through. Oh, so great. yeah, I, I found it hard to put that. down. I should have mentioned before, actually, there's like some awesome writers coming to the Sydney Writers Festival, which, you know, um, I'm doing a few interviews for and stuff. Somebody that is coming is um, Bernadine Evaristo, which I am oh, yeah. like massively thrilled and excited about. I've already got my tickets. For it. Anyway, um, definitely go and have a look at that program because it's um, fabulous. I read a book that I came across in the most gloriously happy way recently. I went to Melbourne to talk at a thing, doing a lot of talking at things, um, and I sat next to, like, so you and I would have responded to this situation differently, I think. So I get on the plane and I put my bag up and there's a woman sitting in the um, uh, window seat and I'm sitting next to her and I say, oh, hi, you know, and she looks up and she goes, <gasps> chatter, full chatter. Right. And she's just like, oh, my God, which is like <laughs> hilarious. I mean, like, you know, you and I don't get, you know, sort of Harry Styles reactions from people. But when we run into a full, like, full platinum chatter, yeah. then it is actually like being yeah. a movie star or something, which yeah. is like extremely nice if you're having a tough day and someone's yeah. like, I'm so pleased to meet you. And you're kind of like, oh, amazing. So we sat down and she's like, I'm not going to be one of these people that just is at you the whole flight. But of course, you know, and you hate that, right? Because you like to be in flights reading yeah. or like whatever. But I'm like, hey, hi. Oh, so we had the best chat, right? And it was the second time that that had happened to me because on the way back from Perth, I sat next to this woman called Anita who was also a chatter and just one of the funniest people I've ever met. She's right. hysterical. Chatters are very easy to talk to, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. And also, like, <laughs> we established, like, very early on in the conversation that she had ADHD. Right. <laughs> well, I'm like, ha, ha, ha. Because, you know, I get that. Um, anyway, so there was a ver lot of, you know. But anyway, um, so Greta, who's the woman on the Melbourne flight, um, is an extremely voracious reader. Right. And so we straight away just got into talking about books. And um, she said, have you read this book called Vladimir by, what's the name of the writer? Julia May Jonas. Yeah. So it was published last year. And I'm like, no, should I? She's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I think you should. I think, yeah. Anyway, so Vladimir is, um, I also texted Helen Garner to advise her about this book going because... You'll understand why when I explain the plot. So Vladimir is um, a story told by a narrator whose name you never find out. And she is like a sort of mid-50s English lecturer at a like American university. And she um, has a husband who's the head of department. And over their 30-year relationship, she's aware that he has regularly shagged his students. And she's not... She's been sort of loosely aware of it. Um, she's not that fussed because they have a relationship where they have, you know, they love each other very much and they're used to each other and they work together well, but they also have separate lives and interests. And she's like, frankly, you know, relieved that he's not pestering her for sex all the time. So, you know. But then what's happened when the book starts is that seven of the women that he slept with have got together and made a group complaint about oh, him. Great. Right? That sounds I knew right up get my alley. In. That's right up my alley. Right. Yeah. And um, they're not arguing that the relationships weren't consensual. What they're arguing is that um, it was inappropriate. Yeah, right. And anyway, she's kind of like in a bind because she thinks, listen, you guys chased yeah. my husband – um, you were right into it. You can't yeah. now complain. Like yeah. you were attracted to him because of his power. Yes. Like so don't complain about the power. It's such a right? good topic for exploring in a novel. Right. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, right, this younger, very hot professor, like lecturer called um he's a young novelist. Female. No male right. called Vladimir. Right. Comes to the university and starts working there. He's got a wife, Cynthia, who is this beautiful 
young woman. They've got a um, – she's also a writer and she's um, writing a memoir about her um, – brutal childhood of which we don't really hear much but you right. know that she's sort of you know that she's um like very disturbed and you know that she has made a suicide attempt right and so and vladimir who is um has written this novel that's just been published which is terrific came and did the interview for this position and mentioned in the interview that his wife had tried to harm herself right and um and he actually made that a pitch for like we really need to come and live somewhere, you know, out of the big city in a college town like this. So then he got the job. And the narrator, who's the um, older woman, finds herself completely sexually fascinated by this Vladimir, right? And so there's a multiple track storyline that is about her relationship with Cynthia, right. her relationship with Vladimir, her relationship with her husband. Oh, that's and it. Great. Yeah. And anyway, um, it's – and look, there are just some bits – like it's not a perfect novel and, you know, I, it sometimes goes a bit – like sometimes it's a bit much but um, there's some genuinely terrific phrases and passages in there that are kind of like just – I don't know, they're kind of spunky. <laughs> I can't think of the right word but like – Anyway, but it's got all of those questions. And towards the end of the book, it's not really a spoiler, um, and, and there's like funny little plot twist, like about two pages in, um, she's talking about watching Vladimir in the afternoon light and seeing the hairs on his arms and he's, she's obsessed with his arms and, you know. And then she just mentions, um, yes, I'm looking at the hand that's not shackled to the chair. And you're like, wait, what? Why is he shackled to the chair? Oh. And so it's like it jumps around. Anyway, oh, it's God, like, that sounds great. Can we yeah. just wrap this up now so I can go and download that immediately right? and start yeah. reading? That sounds great. Yeah, shackled mm. to a chair. But like just returning to the thing that I know piques your interest, um, there is a really good conversation right at the end of the book where – um, the narrator is at home and there's a knock on the door and it's one of the women, like one of the oh, seven complainants. Right. And they have a really interesting conversation where she's like, well, you know, the power thing. I don't – and it's it's very Garner-esque because oh, great. she says um, – I mean, in the sentiment expressed, I mean, not the, not the writing style, but like um, the um, older woman says to this younger woman – I don't get it with you young women like you think you're powerless but look at you like you're you're full of sexual power you're full yeah. of you know like why can't you see that yeah. and cuz from her like and through the whole book she's constantly like doing skincare regimes like she's worried about her sagging boobs and all of this stuff um there's a lot of anxiety there and then the young woman says no but like you don't understand he gave me an ele elevated sense of my own significance. He made me – like he was this brilliant man and he made me feel like I was brilliant too and I didn't realise that this was about sex. I thought I was special and then I kind of graduated and I'm lost. I don't – I'm not special, it turns out. I'm really oh. not. And I feel like he took that – like – Oh, it's such an interesting... That's really interesting. It was a really that, interesting perspective. I guess that's kind of any relationship though, right? Because any, wh whether, there's power, whether there's a power imbalance or not, because the relationship, if you particularly fancy someone, they make you feel special. And then if yeah. they cease to fancy you, then you feel unspecial. But I think the point she's making... I mean, listen to me making this character a real person. I can't wait like, to read it, yeah. The, the point that she's making is, I'm drawn to your brain and your expertise I'm at university my brain is exploding with all this new ideas and you know everything and I know nothing yeah and half of the thrill is sitting around and talking about Sartre or whatever yeah and you made me think that I was on your level and really you were just sitting around waiting to get into my pants you know and going yes you're so clever you know yeah it's, but it was just a really interesting perspective I thought, it is really yeah. like, that is really interesting but I also I mean look I can't wait to read it so we can have a proper discussion but then I also feel like why is there no acknowledgement of the transaction like he's getting sex she's getting made to feel special like I don't yeah. understand it's, it's kind of transactional and also just because he wanted to have sex she presumably did too since it was consensual but also like why um he, he probably did think she was special 
well, I mean, read the book and we'll discuss it. Yeah, but I, just, I can't wait. It was just a really, it was, it was a well articulated, different angle from what yeah, I thought about before. Good. Yeah, it sounds really good. Yeah, um, it's great. So thanks, Greta. Thanks, yeah. Greta from the plane for recommending that. It was a real banger. Cool. Okay. Oh, what are you thinking about now? Oh, uh, just – actually, I was thinking about something I wanted to talk to you about and I thought, nah, I'll save it for the car on the way home. Right. About – about um, oh, it's complex. I don't know how quite how to articulate it, but about victims and um, the elevation of victims to heroic position. And I was wondering, is that a new thing or not a new thing? Is There's, that a historic thing? I read such an interesting essay about this um, and a controversial one, like when um, – it's okay, Beck. It's not that controversial. <laughs> every, time I, every time we mention any of these hot button issues, I can just yeah, I can just hear Frank going, "Oh, the group's going to go off high moderation." So um, I read when I, you know, when I went over to Paris and I did that foreign correspondent on yeah. like the French feminists oh, yeah, and that the was Me Too. Really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Anyway, I read an essay by the woman who was the girl in the Roman Polanski case. Oh yeah. So, and she was like the 13-year-old, you know, and the reason that he's now, you know, um, unable to um, uh, travel is because he's still, you know. Anyway, um, she wrote this essay about her feelings about it and obviously she's often, like, she's just not named. She's like the sort yeah. of, like, the object yeah. in the Roman Polanski, Polanski story. But she's got a really interesting nuanced view now so she said at the time she said I absolutely wanted him prosecuted and um what he did to me was wrong he raped me and that is you know like I was absolutely firm on that and now I feel like he's been punished and now I want to not be that person anymore right she said I don't want to be that victim person right. anymore like we've sorted it and she said there's this amazing line where she says Rape is the only crime where the victim is not permitted to recover. Mm. Anyway, it was just, yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's really, I mean, I bet you there's heaps of stuff and now that we've mentioned it, people probably send us stuff to, um, to like, it, it's very interesting. Even the word victim is sort of problematic, I think. It mm. is, yeah. But, I mean, I like, I kind of wonder... I've, I've often thought with things like, say, Australian of the Year or people who become the spearhead, like, say, their children have, you know, died in some kind of way and then they become, like, the public face of mm. a certain issue. It troubles me how much we ask of those people. My God, I could as not a believe society. more. I could not agree more. I'm always frightened, like, with Rosie Batty or Grace Tame, you know. It's like, I don't know, it's like we f feel that having felt so strongly for them and like loved them and felt protective that we now all have the right to just you know rummage around in their lives well, well and also just to make them keep telling their story yeah. and that, that it's kind of there's a sense I suppose that well um you're doing good by telling your story therefore you have to keep telling it if you stop telling it you, you stop doing good and so I'm troubled by it in two ways because I think, well, there is always a human being at the centre of that. Right. Now, yeah. sometimes that person wants to be doing that because they want to be making the difference or whatever. But I feel like at what point, you know, does it become where the, the victim, in inverted commas, no longer has agency um, because it's just kind of expected that they'll keep telling their story. And also I know myself as an interviewer, not everyone is good at interviewing or right. making people talk about a traumatic story. Well, but there's a feeling that once you've told your story that it's everybody's property to ask you about any time. Exactly, that's right. Like, for instance, I remember it, like a very, very rare instance of being on the receiving end of this. You and I were doing an interview about, I don't know, a sh book or a show or something. It oh, was in yeah. the last year. And um, we were on the phone and we were talking about Chat 10 Looks 3 and, you know, it was all very bubbly and sort of, you know, yes, you know, blah, 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 and the group's amazing and whatever. And the interviewer just like, what are they, like without any kind of, he's like, and, you know, you get a lot of support from the group. I mean, um, you know, you decided to talk to the group about your brother's suicide. Um, you know, how was, you know, tell and us about it just, that. It just literally got <laughs> dropped out with no warning whatsoever. I know. And I just like I nearly started crying because I just wasn't really expecting it. And I yes, I did talk about it, and I'm happy to. But like, it was just so weird to just. It was so businesslike, and 
I was just, I, I just sort of went, uh, oh, um, yeah. you know, I kind of recovered, but I wrote to was, complain, and and they did apologise, of course. So I love I, that you wrote to complain. Well, You're I like, did because my, my I, friend, you can't like that. You just can't drop things like that on people with, particularly when the context is that you think you're just going on to have a light chat about chat 10, right? Yeah. So you haven't spent any time emotionally preparing yourself mm. that you're about to be asked about something really difficult mm. and confronting. Mm. I do wonder as well about like, again, I feel like surely someone's written an essay about this, about like say historically, like what kind of things historically have we viewed as being heroic, right? So that it would have been in certain eras, great acts of valour, courage Mm -hmm. um you know wartime acts like i don't know all the things that are are heroic but wonder what what is the effect of when we make being victimhood heroic right if you choose to then yeah but i mean do we make victimhood heroic or do we make strength in the face of victimhood heroic i think there's a difference yeah because but then i think in so doing we also do this huge expectations management problem which is we kind of say that there's one way to be a victim exactly and that's the right way exactly which is actually massively it's like when people have cancer and like exactly and everyone's like we're well, so brave i mean just fighting cancer yeah and the person's like well actually i just feel like shit a lot of the time i'd feel really scared and i'm not feeling very brave but does that mean that i'm failing at cancer you know like yeah yeah, that's. I think that's really interesting that it kind of sets up that, well, there's one way to be this and it's to, you know, sh- sh- have a show of strength and mm. campaign for change or do whatever. And, like, actually, no, you're allowed to just, like, not get out of bed if you want. Yeah. So, and also anyway, with simplify great. and simplify and simplify. Like with Grace Tame, for instance, you know, she was not, you know, like sometimes she's casually ascribed authorship of the Let Her Speak campaign, which is not – she was one of, like, a bunch, you know. Yeah. So – and – that's out of her control too because other people were like, you know, oh, yes, she's the leader of this. And she's like, oh, wait, 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 no, I'm not, uh, Jesus. Well, so and also like- it becomes problematic when you, like in that J.K. Rowling podcast I was talking about, The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, she talks about how there was a period after Harry Potter came out where she, she, she said she felt like among the fans that she was almost deified. Right. And she's like, I'm an actual human being. Like no one can actually deal mm. with that level of, oh, this person's so brave and heroic and amazing because mm. you're a normal yeah. human being. So you not all of that and so this is the other thing as well that where the pressure of expectations of someone who's held up as being you yeah. know like they're never going to put a foot wrong they're never going to act in a you know any way that's anything other than kind of saintly is you know really problematic too and I'm, I'm just hoping the all of this kind of area it's so interesting and I, I I sort of can't process what I think so I'm hoping someone's about to send us an essay oh and god go, you've got to read this yeah, essay right. about this exa- or this book about <laughs> it's so good so if, you, if that's you please drop us a line and let us know on a cheerio note yes I went to see the Alexander McQueen exhibition oh, at the MGB. Oh God, did you love it? Oh, I knew you'd my love God! It. I wish we'd been there at the same time. Sure, but I think it would have become embarrassing, honestly. Oh, so just... I was to- I was actually talking to the, um, our friend Nick um, of from the work. Sardines. No, no, not of the Sardines, right. Melbourne-based um, right. Nick, um, and he <laughs> he went along and he's like, "Yeah, I don't know, like." What did you think of that? And I'm like, oh, my God. I was, like, climaxing. I was just like, it's, it's the greatest. And he's like, yeah. I just thought, yeah, this guy's really good at sewing. But that dress looks really similar to that dress. And I'm like, oh. So, I mean, you know, I – so I watched that um, that uh, biopic um, about um, – uh, Alexander McQueen. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a good film and I found out a lot about him. Um but like, far out. Those garments are just unbelievable. Like the assurance of the tailoring and the they're sculptures essentially. So they, it's just a coincidence that they're made of fabric and oh, that they're yeah. wearable. I, but I, um, I loved about the exhibition the fact that you've got this really deep account of all of his influences. Yeah. So there would be like a like a maybe a collection of um, garments, but there'd be also this sort of, you know, um, 14th century oil painting, you know, on which, you know, that that, that he was sort of um, inspired by. And just the 
broad, small C Catholic range of things that made him think. And yeah, like, it was imagine great. having a brain that worked like that. Just <sighs> incredible. It was so well curated, wasn't it? It really was. And then also mm. there'd be like sort of original 18th century corsetry and like gowns that influenced this particular, you know, yeah. show. Um, show. And it was just, yeah, just the, the depth of thought that went into it, like his creative process was absolutely astounding, I thought. Yeah, yeah. I was just walking around in raptures of, at that. I could not have loved it more. That dress looks a bit similar to that dress. Get in the bin, <laughs> Nick. <laughs> Right, now we need to get going. Yeah, we do. Cool. Uh, all right. See well, you next time. Yeah. Next time I see I see you, I will have watched some of the new season of Succession. Yeah, okay, all right. Can't wait to talk about that. Bye. Bye.